Welcome to the coming apocalypse. Evangelist and pastor Paul Bagley will take you on a journey into the end times prophecy. He'll examine current world events and explain how they relate to the end times. For decades, Pastor Bagley has provided people all over the world with an understanding of today's world events from a biblical perspective. Now, here's your host, Pastor Paul Bagley. Welcome. This is the coming apocalypse. I'm Pastor Paul Begley, and today we're going to take a look at something that's, I don't even know if you've ever heard of this, the seven prophetic earthquakes in the Bible. Seven prophetic earthquakes in the Bible. And believe me, there's more earthquakes than that in the Bible. But I want to look at these seven because they're very powerful and they're leading you up to the very end, all right? Now, the very first earthquake, really, that has been calculated or uh, recognized in the Bible would be Genesis chapter 7, 11. It actually talks about the coming of Noah's flood. I believe there was many earthquakes, uh, you know, no doubt in the formation of the earth. There's, there's been a lot done. But this is a very prophetic earthquake because the Bible talks about, you know, the fountains of the deep opening up. From and, and flooding the earth. It didn't just only rain water down in Noah's day, but it literally uh, came up out of the fountains of the earth. So today what we're going to do is study the seven prophetic earthquakes uh, in the Bible. And without a question, uh, when you take a look at these things, notice this, when you see these big earthquakes now, you got to know that prophetically, Jesus said in the last days there would be earthquakes in diverse places. I, I, one day I was uh, studying. I study the earthquakes every day. I have for the last six years every day. Every earthquake over 2.5 or higher. I remember seeing one day an earthquake on Easter Island and another one on Ascension Island in the same day. That's the name of the islands, two different places. And I said to myself, what is up with that? Uh, certainly God is speaking to us. Uh, and there were some major earthquakes. At one point, there were seven earthquakes that happened in exactly 188 days apart. And we studied these cycles, and I did some YouTube videos on it. The first one was in Concepcion, Chile. It was 8.3. And then 188 days later, there was another earthquake and it was in Christ Church, New Zealand, and it was 7.6, and there were people killed in both locations, and it was terrible. And the third one was in Japan on 3.11.11, and that was that mega quake with the mega tsunami and everything. And those were falling exactly on 188 days. And after the third one, I just kept watching, and exactly 188 days, there was always another quake, seven times in a row. So there is something prophetically taking place even now, certainly now, as we're in the last days. I'll be right back. We're going to really get into this in just a moment. Thank you so much for watching the broadcast. I really appreciate it. And I'll tell you something. If you'd like to know more about some of our books that we've written, go to our website at www.paulbegleyprophecy.com. That's www.paulbegleyprophecy.com. I've even got music CDs. I actually have a couple country gospel music CDs that we recorded that I think you'll really enjoy. I have five books that I've written. This is my newest one, Jerusalem Jihad. Jerusalem Jihad. This has to do about an end time apocalyptic scenario that includes the rebuilding of the temple, also uh, the two witnesses, and uh, it's a powerful presentation, if you will, on how things are starting to come together here in the last days. So again, check out all of our books uh, CDs and everything else we have and your donations are greatly appreciated at our website. God bless you in Jesus name. Are you serious? I know I've got your attention on these seven prophetic earthquakes and, and you may have never heard of that 188 day earthquake cycle but uh, without question the Lord speaks through these apocalyptic events. And it's going to blow your mind. So the first one we're going to talk about today, seven prophetic earthquakes. The first one we just discussed was the one that created or was involved in the great flood, Noah's flood, all right, in Genesis 7, 11. Also, turn your Bible right now to Exodus chapter 19, verses 18 and 20. 
18 through 20, because we're going to, this is when Moses went on top of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. And during that very prophetic time, an earthquake also came. Let's read it. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 18, the Bible says, And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. Um, so here's a major earthquake in receiving the Ten Commandments. Verse 19. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up. This was the great deliverance of the Ten Commandments or the law. The Bible tells you in other places that God wrote these commandments on tablets of stone with the fiery finger of his hand. And uh, the earth smoke fire, and of course, a mighty earthquake as the whole mountain shook. Moses gets up there and receives God's commandments for the children of Israel. Now, the children of Israel have come out of Egypt, 400 years of slavery. Now, they finally got out of there. Pharaoh's drowned in the sea. They're in the wilderness. And what do we do now, Moses? And the Lord says, let me tell you, I've got a plan for the children of Israel. I have a plan, Moses. I want to give you some commandments. I want to set some rules. It'll be for your benefit. I'm going to give you the type of food to eat. I'm going to tell you to rest on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day and, and keep that as a holy day and rest. Just like I rested, God was saying, when he created everything and he rested on the seventh day. Moses, I'm going to tell you the foods that are harmful and are not healthy for you. I'm going to show you uh, how marriage should work. I'm going to explain to you how you should treat one another. I'm going to set some ground rules uh, for a society to function and to be blessed, including an economy that includes uh, a smita year every seventh year and on the 50th year, a year of jubilee where all debts are canceled. So, so this is a big deal, folks. I mean, what I'm trying to tell you, this is a big deal. And that's why there was a big quake. So first quake, Noah's flood. Second quake, the deliverance of the commandments to Moses. And let's take a look at another very prophetic quake. And that was the judgment quake of rebellion. The consequences and God proving that he will not tolerate rebellion. Um, and so if you turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 16, I'm going to be reading verses 31 through 33. The Bible says in verse 31, And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to him went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. I mean, are you serious? This is known as the sin of Korah. What happened was Korah led a rebellion, just like Lucifer led a rebellion in heaven. And he gathered 250 elders of Israel from all 12 tribes and actually came and, and, and made a proclamation to Moses that Aaron was not very well anointed. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> are you serious? Uh, uh, I mean, I've heard that in my own ministry from time to time, but, but you just don't do that to Moses and Aaron. And so anyway, um, they called a meeting. Well, Moses says, really? Uh, they said, yeah, our anointing oil is better and our fire is better. What, what the problem was here is they didn't use the fire from off the brazen altar that God had commanded in the Ten Commandments. But instead, they brought their own fire that they were using 
to a pagan god. And they said, we have more power and we, and, and more, and we should lead this people. And so Moses said, I'll tell you what, tomorrow I'll come back. Bring your fire, bring your oil. Meet me out front, in front of the tabernacle. Don't come in. Don't come in. Stay outside the door. I'll meet you. Me and Aaron will be out there, Aaron and I. We'll be out there and we'll meet you. So, okay, the next day comes. There's Moses. There's Aaron. There is all of the elders. And the whole congregation of Israel showed up because this is a showdown, a showdown for power. And Moses begins to tell them that they're in rebellion. Moses begins to say, look, you guys, what are you doing? Are you serious, basically? Um, and, you know, because God chose Aaron to be the high priest of the uh, Arianic priesthood, and then which would eventually become the Le Levitical priesthood, all the way to Jesus Christ. Aaron was a, a type of representation of Christ in the, in the early beginnings here of the uh, children of Israel. So uh, they have their fire, they have their oil, they are in total rebellion, and Moses proclaims to them that they're in rebellion and sin. And all of a sudden, a major earthquake comes, opens up the ground, swallows them, and no doubt as this thing was going, then it closed back up on them. I mean, an incredible event to happen and, and destroyed their houses and different things. But it didn't stop there, folks. It, the Bible says then a plague began right then, started to spread quickly through the children of Israel that were there to observe what was going on. They were dropping dead like flies. Aaron saw the people were dying. He took his staff, his rod that was used once to bud and to come alive to show the power of God. Aaron took off running through the crowd of bodies falling. And when he got ahead of the plague, he stuck his rod in the ground and stopped the plague. This sent a message to everybody. There is consequences for sin. And let me say this to you. There's consequences for going into rebellion or to following people who go into rebellion. I'm going to be frank with you. If somebody is in your church trying to re rise up a rebellion against your pastor and trying to get rid of them, don't you dare follow that rebellion. Whatever you do, you stay back and you pray for the pastor, you pray for the church, but don't fall into the pit of rebellion. Uh, God won't tolerate it. He didn't then. He won't now. All right. Uh, it's just a serious issue. Wow. Are you serious? Seven prophetic earthquakes. That's three of them. I'll be right back in a moment with the other four on the coming apocalypse. A brand new book I've just finished called Reflections from the Land of the Prophets. This book is filled with beautiful pictures, a pictorial, if you will, of the Holy Land, and some definite great insight to the prophets that once spoke mightily in the times leading us up to the present. It's a prophetic word, a reflection of what God has spoken, not only historically from the past, but for the future. Go to my website. It's available now. Are you serious? This is no question. The seven prophetic earthquakes in the Bible. There's actually more than that, but these are very significant. We've had number one, earthquake, Noah's flood. Number two, Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai. Number three, the sin of Korah, the rebellion that God wouldn't tolerate. Number four, how can you forget the story of Joshua and the walls of Jericho? And we know the story, how that they... Joshua now led the children of Israel. They're in Canaan. First thing they got to do is take this city. It's a city. It's a cursed city of sin. And God tells Joshua to get the seven priests with the seven ram horns and get the Ark of the Covenant God because we're going to be marching around this city and we're going to obey the Lord in this process. Matter of fact, we're going to march around it once a day. Not going to say a word. Going to do that for six days in a row. And then on the seventh day, we're going to march around this city seven times with the seven priests and seven ram horns and the ark of the covenant with God. And on the shout, the walls are coming down. All right, now let's read it for, together in Joshua chapter 6, verse 20. The Bible says, and so the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass that when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted, with a great shout that the wall 
fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. This, some could say the shouting brought down the walls. The shouting might have caused the earthquake. We know this. The Seattle Seahawks, who play in a football stadium there in Seattle, they have twice in football games, the people have shouted so loud twice that it has caused two different small quakes. So it can happen. And you have to understand, that's with a crowd in Seattle, Washington, a crowd of about 70,000 people. You have to understand, the children of Israel are uh, way over. They, they left Egypt with 600,000 men plus women and children. They went 40 years in the wilderness. I mean, we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 to 3 million people shouting with the voice of triumph and the Ark of the Covenant. Something's going to go to shaking and quake, and I, I guarantee it. The devil's back went to breaking on that one, and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. And it was a great victory for the children of Israel and a very prophetic quake. Now, if you'll turn your Bible over into Matthew chapter 27, I want to read for you another major event, another major earthquake, very prophetically. And that is during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I mean, here's the Son of God on the cross just before the Passover. He's already been tried by the high priest Caiaphas. He's already been beaten and striped and, uh, uh, by Pontimus Pilate. He's already been spit upon and cursed and kicked and uh, crucified by the Roman soldiers. And he's up hanging on the cross near death. And he does say to the Father in verse 50, I'll read that one, verse 50, Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. He died. And the Bible says in verse 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks were rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Are you serious? But look at the next verse. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus, meaning watching him die, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. Now, this is very important. You had an earthquake when God wanted to restart the earth with Noah. You have a quake. You have an earthquake when God wants to give a coveted, a covenant of a law unto his servant Moses and the people. We get a quake. We have a God sending a, a penalty for sin upon the children of Israel because of the rebellion. You have a quake. We have God proving that he won't tolerate anything that's paganistic like the uh, city of Jericho. And in victory, God sends a quake. And then at the cross of Calvary, as Jesus dies, there's a major earthquake, so strong of a quake that the, that the veil inside the temple, folks, that wasn't some little curtain either. I'm talking about a curtain that's two foot deep, two foot thick. I mean, from the top of the uh, of Solomon's temple all the way down to the bottom. This, it couldn't, they said that teams of mules on either side pulling on this could not pull it apart. There's no way to divide this thing. But the earthquake was so powerful that the temple rocked upon the temple mount and gave way and tore the veil in half. And this is very significant because until then, no one could get into the Holy of Holies except the high priest. And that was only on once a year on Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. But when Jesus died, the veil was torn in half. Everybody could look right into the Holy of Holies, and yet nobody died. Why? Because the power of God shifted from the top, the mercy seat on the ark, to the mercy seat at Golgotha, where Jesus Christ, his blood was shed to set people free from sin it was so significant it was so unbelievable it was so powerful that the earth shaked 
and quake. But wait, we're not done. Turn, if you will, <laughs> to number seven. I'm going to look at this quake. Turn the page in your Bible to Matthew chapter 28. Let's read verses one and two. Now, we know Jesus is put in the grave. His body's going to lay in the tomb. Man, we could just preach a message on that whole subject. The, uh, you know, we know he was the Passover lamb. We know he's the unleavened bread that laid in the tomb for three days. His body did not decay. It was already prophesied by David in the book of Psalms that my holy one shall not see corruption. That's why he was the unleavened bread. And then he rose from the grave, making him the first fruits of the resurrection. That means the feast of Passover, the feast of the unleavened bread, and the feast of the first fruits represents Jesus Christ, his death burial and resurrection i mean are you serious this is what god can do his word is so unbelievable that's why that's so prophetic matter of fact 75 percent of your bible is prophecy don't run from prophecy run toward it because you have nothing to fear because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world but let's read this right here and so if you go to matthew 28 verse 1 and 2 in the end of the sabbath as it began to dawn Toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. So we have an earthquake at the crucifixion and an earthquake at the resurrection. Powerful quakes, prophetically to prove that these are significant events in Bible prophecy. Now, go with me quickly, if you will, to Revelation chapter 11, because there's another quake coming that is so prophetic, it ha it's mentioned in your Bible, a prophecy of a quake. These other seven I just gave you are historical accounts. They've already happened. This one is yet to come. Let's read it. In the book of Revelation chapter 11, Verse 3, we talk about the two witnesses. The Bible says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, and it rained not in the days of their prophecy. They have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as they often will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So it's in Jerusalem. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and they'll make merry they'll send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth and after three days and a half the spirit of life from God entered into them they stood upon their feet great fear fell upon them which saw them and now here's what it says and they heard a great voice from heaven saying come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them and the last verse, 13, and the same hour was there a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell and in the earthquake was slain of men 7,000 and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God of heaven. This earthquake has not happened yet. The other seven did, the other, I mean the other six, very prophetic, but this is the seventh quake that is going to take place the seventh quake, so prophetic will it be because it will prove again that the witnesses were of God, that they died and they rose from the grave, they rose from the dead, ascended to heaven. This is the earthquake of the end times. And did you know that Israel two years ago did an earthquake drill in Jerusalem? And in the earthquake drill, they practiced what would, how do we do a drill if 7,000 people died? 
Why in the world would they practice it? Because somebody in Israel is reading the New Testament and they're getting prepared for a time yet to come. I'll be right back with more in just a moment. For Horsemen of the Apocalypse, a four DVD set that looks into the most controversial subjects of the end time prophecies. The Four Horsemen. Oh yes, we're talking about the white one, the red, the black, the green, all of these phases of the breaking of the seals in these end times. Are you ready for the challenge? Well, get this DVD set only at my website at paulbegleyprophecy.com. A brand new DVD, Rapture Ready. Finally, we're going to answer the question. Millions of people want to know, what is the rapture? When is the rapture? And am I ready for the rapture? Well, this brand new DVD is filled with information, scripture, a PowerPoint presentation that will help you prepare to be rapture ready. We're living in those days. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Get this DVD now at my website. Look, it's all coming down to this, folks. The seven prophetic earthquakes is pointing, seven being a perfect number, but it's pointing to the coming of Jesus Christ. And you have to be ready. Some of you are watching right now, you say, Paul, I, you, wow. I mean, the prophecies are happening so fast, Pastor. I, I, I'm not right with God, and I, I'm not ready. Let's get saved. Let's get, let's get saved. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so if you'll pray, I'll pray right now. Let's pray and let's choose Jesus Christ as our Savior. You can repeat after me or pray along with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to be saved. I want to be born again. I want to be set free from the chains of darkness. I'm repenting of my sins and I'm calling upon the name of the Lord. I need your mercy. God, I need your grace. I open my heart to Jesus to come into my life to save me because I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he ascended into heaven, and that he's coming back. I repent of my sins. I want to be ready. So right here, right now, today, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name, I am saved. I am saved. Praise God. God bless you.